I just never really got into like, I need to do this or I need to do that. I was just like, what's difficult, send it to me and then let me figure this out. And then, okay, I figured that out, I'm good. Hey everybody, this edition of Lineheart Radio is brought to you by the world's first creatine coffee. Each scoop is a full cup of a Colombian Arabica bean coffee infused with five grams of a creatine monohydrate. Now here's the deal, guys. A lot of people have differing opinions about creatine, and unfortunately, a lot of really shitty supplement companies have tried to sell it to kids that want to get big and they package it as some kind of steroid alternative and they tell you if you cycle it and if you stack it then you'll gain a bunch of muscle mass and at the end of the day none of that is true what is true is that it's one of the most studied and beneficial supplements on the market for strength recovery and endurance so whether you're a runner whether you are a strength athlete Uh, or whether you're somebody that wants to enhance cognitive function and just feel healthier in everyday life, a pharmaceutical-grade creatine monohydrate is going to help get you there. Go to www.creatinecoffee.com to learn what all the hype is about. And now, on to the show. All right, welcome back to Lionheart Radio. I'm your host, Rick Alexander, founder of Lou Aviv in San Diego, California. And if you've spent any amount of time around fitness, uh, certainly around CrossFit and endurance in the last decade, you're familiar with my guest today, Brian McKenzie. He actually has far too many accolades to discuss here in a concise bio, but uh, he is an, he's an accomplished endurance athlete, finishing both an Ironman as well as many ultra marathons. He's also the author of Power Speed Endurance, the New York Times bestseller, Unbreakable Runner, plus his latest work, Unplugged, which he co-authored with Dr. Andy Galpin. And if you guys remember back a few episodes, we were in Cal State Fullerton talking with Dr. Galpin, and we kind of covered that book in uh, length. He's also the founder of PowerSpeedEndurance.com and the founder of XPT. So Brian, thanks for being on today. Thanks for having me, Rick. So I was doing some research for for this show, and I came across a 2013 article in Outside Magazine uh, uh-huh. talking talking about uh, how controversial it was at the time, essentially to train with short bouts of intensity uh, and try to get a endurance type adaptation with that kind of a training. Are you familiar with that the article I'm talking about? Yep. Awesome. So uh, I'm curious, and you're the original founder of CrossFit Endurance. So I'm curious, what, what originally gave you the inclination to begin uh, down that path, especially when it was so counterintuitive to mainstream, you know, it's conventional this is, knowledge? This is so serendipitous. I just did a uh, an interview, like I told you, mm-hmm. <laughs> for a blog we're writing, and it's about this exact same thing. Um, so... My experience with endurance sports was I was I was coerced into doing a triathlon in in 2001 um, by a friend of mine who was uh, who who inevitably was a mentor of mine, um, a very successful guy um, who lived in Laguna Beach and ended up introducing me to Dr. Romanoff, the Pose Method. Um, CrossFit to some degree. Um, he was just kind of somebody who was always searching things out and this will help toward at the end of the interview too. Mm -hmm. But, um, I became enamored with process and I got caught in a lot of stuff that a lot of people in the endurance world get caught in. We, we, we inevitably, once we start, once the adaptation starts to occur with endurance training, we get caught up in the long effort stuff. And, that is perfectly fine, but there is a very large difference in, and I'll just use a marathon as an example. Okay. In in doing a marathon in four or four and a half hours, compared to doing a marathon in three or three and a half hours, and people think that there's this real, there's a connection to going long and 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 getting faster. And there's no real connection to that. You actually have to put in hard work and, and hard work, although (laughs) we like to confuse ourselves can be, and and there's nothing wrong with this, can be going out and running long distances. That is very difficult. It's also very difficult to jump on top of a BOSU ball and do overhead squats on top of it. Although I've done that 
there was no real transferability into training with that type of thinking. And I'm not comparing the two in that in, in that they don't, both don't have application. Longer running will have some application for doing longer distances. The tissue breakdown and the things that happen at those longer distances are absolutely things that are necessary. But these are also things that basically we we started understanding were things you did during racing and and your races progressed. And my my kind of transition it through triathlon was one that started with short course triathlon. And I did a bunch of short course triathlons in the first year, year and a half I was doing triathlon prior to actually doing a half Ironman. And although I bit off, you know, as, as endurance athletes like to do more than I could really chew at the time, mm-hmm. I had a great time at the, at the half Ironman and I had a decent time at the time. Um, and I inevitably wanted to do an even longer event, which was an Ironman, which, you know, I ended up doing the Ironman and I did a bunch of triathlons in between then. I think I did maybe one more half and I did a bunch of short course triathlons in between, but I was doing short distances and I was, you know, inevitably ended up getting to the Ironman distance. But my training log was, I mean, I was logging mile after mile after mile. I mean, I was probably for the Ironman riding close to three or 400 miles a week. Um, you know, and, and running 50, 60 miles a week. And I was swimming maybe twice a week because I had a background in swimming. So it all came about more or less because I started connecting dots. Like, what was I good at? Well, I started competitively swimming basically at the age of four. So I had a technical background in swimming that had been developed over years. And so I didn't need to spend as much time doing that, but developing the skill came with doing some dry land work too, and doing some core work and then understanding how strength and conditioning fit in. And, you know, this whole model started to evolve because people challenged beliefs that I started taking on. And so I really was challenged with the thinking that I had where I needed to go out and run longer to do an event versus getting faster and stronger in order to hold up for that time period. Now, it was learning how to mold it all together that inevitably became that process. And by and large, with every athlete we were working with, and we had a lot of athletes at the time, you know, I'm talking probably in the vicinity of, you know, 50 to 100 athletes within this coaching structure we had formed and, you know, community we had built that we're all having tremendous results with lowering the volume overall and focusing more on skill and intensity development. And just because I'm saying intensity didn't mean everything was, I go out and run and with a pegged. That is not what we're talking about. You can't run 400 meters repeatedly pegged. You can't run 800 meters repeatedly pegged. In fact, those two very those two distances have to be vastly changed in order to do repeat efforts on those things. Intensity and both, level, you mean? Yeah, the intensity level has to be changed. And sure. it's not that we weren't even just doing those, you know, distances. We were doing many different distances and we were using tempo and we were, you know, sending people out and instead of just doing an easy 10K, you're running it within 80 to 95% of your best time, which isn't necessarily easy, but it's not necessarily super difficult. It's not a race type scenario, but we were developing higher level aerobic capacity at those at, with that type of thinking. And so it allowed the athletes, the people who weren't professional athletes to actually get dosed with what the real or the qualitative pieces of elite training packages actually offered. Mm-hmm. So I think that was really the mindset behind it all. And, and, you know, it's really fun to write and, and outside magazine is really known, known for this, for making things very controversial. Although, you know, it was a very, it, 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 it is, and was a very polarizing program, but it, you know, as I are, as irony has now, it's become mainstream. And when you have guys like Dave Scott who now deal basically in the exact same way with athletes, we're talking from strength and conditioning to the intensity of training to the diet prescriptions that he's now talking about with all of his athletes, 
which is awesome. And I'm not, th- and I don't think that this is because of what we did. I think this is because Dave literally challenged his own thinking and wanted to evolve. And when you really are able to look at those things, you can evolve and you can change things. Yeah, sure. And you're talking about Dave Scott, Ironman world champion. You got it. Correct. Yep. Uh, Who is now coaching, you know, how many world-class Iron Manners and triathletes. <laughs> right. And so you just see this as the natural progression of things, essentially. Like this is where we're at as far as our knowledge on endurance training. Yes. So I can speak to that because uh, as I was telling you pre-show, I just did the Boston Marathon a couple of days ago. I yep. Sp- I've spent a lot of months uh, trying to build my base mileage because I've recently gotten to ultra running. And uh, at, during the Boston, I'm like, okay, well, I want to get a good time. When I would creep into, for me, into the sevens is fast, like low seven minute miles is fast for yeah. me. When I would creep into that, I, I would just hurt. It would just hurt really bad to sustain it. So after eight miles, I was like, I'm going to wreck if I stay at this speed. And so I had to essentially drop back even 30 seconds per mile into the eights. And now I'm comfortable because that's where I've done all of my mileage. And so I can definitely speak to what you were saying at first, which is you have to put in that high intensity work or it's not going to be there when you go to draw from the well. Right? Yeah, exactly. So I'm curious, where did, so the, the high intensity work I completely get, uh, and speed work has been around for a long time. Oh yeah. This but, isn't new thinking. It's just, you know, the principle, we basically, it, it's a lot of like what we're doing with a lot of the breathing stuff that that's going on is we're, I, I'm not trying like one, it, we, we don't have a method. We, we basically have a principles based program. Hmm. That's it. And that's and, power speed endurance. Yeah. Yeah. And, and, and there's nothing wrong with going out and running and building a base. Just be very clear with what you're doing though. And if you're not mechanically efficient, which is where the difference between a lot of the higher intensity running requires much more efficient mechanics because you're going to find out real quick if you're not running well and it's going to hurt bad and you may end up feel like you're getting injured. And, and this is where people start to create myths around volume, you know, about doing long distance or about doing intense work. I just get hurt or I'll get hurt doing that. And even people who are saying they'll get hurt doing long runs. Well, no, that it's not the long run and it's not the intensity. It's your mechanics. Right. It's, so. that, that is the problem. And so, but the, the irony is, is that I, you know, most people, if we have them sprint, they run pretty well. It's when they start to fall apart, when they start running, when they're running fast, that where their physiology catches up to them, that the mecha- you, you can't hide from fatigue, which is the beauty in CrossFit. And this is what Glassman talked about. And this is why I love Greg's thinking is it's, I don't, I don't care what you're capable of. I'm going to expose every hole you've got. And, and under fatigue, under stress, we really find out a lot about your movement flaws. And so we can not only develop a strength and conditioning or a movement program based on what's going on with you and where you're falling apart. But we can really pull back on some of that mileage and some of that stuff and implement higher quality, you know, things in there. So I could have you running some longer stuff, but I could also have you, you know, have you out there holding eight minute miles on a 10 mile or 15 mile run. But let's just say every five minutes, we're going to take that up to six thirties, six forty five pace. And you're going to hold that for a minute. And then bring that down. There's intensity for you. Hmm. And so how you know, there's not a whole lot of people who are really understanding those kind of things that are just going out and going and running long because I just want to go run long. And right. I think this is where a lot of the stuff got polarizing about it. You know, is because people were like, oh, they're saying we can't do this. And I'm no, I'm not saying you can't do it. You can do it all you want. It's, you know, it's just let's differentiate four hour marathon or three thirty from three three hour, you know? Yeah, absolutely. So just like when you go to you know run a faster race and you haven't put in the work at a high intensity, uh, couldn't you say the same thing about doing a prolonged effort? So 12 to 15 hours into a race, if you haven't done it in training, it also won't be there just like the speed wouldn't be there? You would think, but that is not the case. Okay, and that's not what you found. That's what I'm curious about. Yeah, that is not what I found and that was the case. And 
it's been an interesting thing because you just have to learn, oh, I can't be intense. You know, a hundred mile run <laughs> is not the same as a marathon. And so I really need to think about what it is I'm doing when I'm out there. And, you know, look, there's been a lot of people I've talked to over the last decade who were like, I want to go run a hundred miles. And I'm like, all right, have you done 50? No. Okay. So you should probably figure out how you're going to get to 50 first run 50. And if you can answer yourself in the net, in the, you know, a few days finishing 50 miles that you want to run a hundred, you might do it, but that's not a guarantee anyway, because a hundred miles is a vastly different thing than that. But yet I went and did a hundred miles in the longest run. The longest training session I had was literally under two hours for a hundred miler for a hundred miler. And, uh, did you have a good time in that hundred miler? I, I ran the Angeles crest 127 hours and a little over 27 hours and some change. So I finished 39th in that yeah. race without training over two hours, without training over two hours. Hmm. And did and a lot of people point at that? Of, just, are, what's that? Go ahead. I'm sorry. Did a lot of people just point at that though and say, well, you might be a genetic freak. <laughs> I I'd be a very very hard case to say I'm a genetic freak for endurance training. <laughs> As I I not only have done enough uh you know testing to understand that I'm more of a power in you know I I I am more apt to developing power hence why I was a short course sprinter and never wanted to swim over 100 yards. Um for 20 years, <laughs> um, but that I can adapt to something fairly well by doing shorter distances and things. Now, if I have somebody who's more aerobically inclined, yeah, we can, we can see that. But I've, I've got a guy who I've worked with for years who is a high level ultra endurance athlete. His name's Mark Matisiak, who he's, I mean, he finishes in the top five, top 10. And the longest runs he does are 20 or 21 miles leading into hundred milers. Wow. Yeah. It, where does strength come in when you're training somebody like that? Because you have to, um, it, 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 you have to figure out what's the best approach, like what's their response. Um, you know, from an overarching theme, it's like probably no more than three days a week. You're doing strength and conditioning, maybe four tops. Some people can handle that four. um, but, but, but the strength and conditioning piece comes in into developing the tissue. We're not trying to turn people into bodybuilders. This is where a lot of the endurance community misses the, the whole you know, basis on this is strength and conditioning doesn't mean bodybuilding. It doesn't mean big bulky people. If you're, if you're running ultra marathons, if you're doing uh, endurance events, it's going to be very hard for you to put on too much muscle mass. Very hard. Yeah, completely. And if you're actually putting on mass, you've been deficient. <laughs> so your body's going to where it naturally should be. You know, if I can go out and work for a 12 hour day, and if I'm wearing a Fitbit or a heart rate monitor in which we have done this, and it's saying I just basically did uh, high level aerobic intervals all day long versus I was just gardening and doing yard work, you know? They're like, how did I do that if I didn't train for that? So having an average heart rate of 120 or 130 for the entire day because I'm lifting stuff, I'm digging stuff, I'm shoveling stuff, I'm, you know, I'm doing all this stuff all day long. How did that happen? And it, it, and it, it, it just comes down to physiology and response. And we like to confuse ourselves with, with predisposed beliefs that, you know, you got to go run long. Sure, go run long if you if you like, but you don't have to do anything and figure out, hey, there's there's a big difference in going and run 20 miles at 8 minute mile pace versus 20 miles at 7:30 pace, right? Yeah. Right. Yeah. Absolutely. Yeah. So, if I can have you going and doing 15 miles at 7 minute mile pace versus 20 miles at 8 minute mile pace, what's going to what's going to make the bigger physiological adaptation? Well, what's the bigger stressor? Well, definitely a bigger stressor, stress to your body would be the, the higher intensity for sure. Without a doubt. For sure. 
And so there would be more, you'd need more, you would need, the, your body would want to respond at a higher level to that. Right? right. So that's where that whole, but yet 15 miles is an aerobic effort, largely. Yeah. Sure. It's an intense, that'd be an intense 15 miles. So I, I've just basically taken something and said, Hey, if you're going to train for something, you want to get faster. Look, look at this realistically. Don't take the volume approach because there's been no world-class Ironmaner who started doing Ironmans. They didn't start their career doing Ironmans. Right. It's been no world-class marathoner who started doing, the, who started their career doing marathons. They all started at 5,000 meters and below. Sure. And that's where their careers began. And they literally took years of development with speed and getting those mile times down. You know, Dean Karnazes was a very, very fast runner. He still is. Right. Yeah. I and mean, he, he does speed work and he gets it. So, you know, there, there's all, all this stuff has play into it. And it's like, hey, if you're going to go run long, go run long. But I would be doing some some heavy duty some work on some speed and some and some strength and conditioning stuff as well. And if you don't want to do the strength and conditioning, perfectly fine. Do some body weight stuff that's, you know, extreme enough to challenge the tissue and challenge positions that you're going to need to be in for long periods of time. So, in order to establish a little bit of context here, when you're training athletes, especially in the CrossFit endurance type methods and we'll kind of get to the the methodologies you're currently using, but when you're training these athletes and they're doing these circuit workouts with a lot of weight training, are you, are you training them to stay comfortable, to stay aerobic? Well, it, I mean, let's be clear. Anything over mm, two minutes is going to be predominantly aerobic. Right, because you can't you can't. function without oxygen. Yeah. Right. <laughs> so, so, you know – it all becomes an aerobic deal. In fact, multiple six second max efforts become aerobic after I think like four or five. Hmm. It, it's, it's crazy when you start really reading into this stuff. So it doesn't become an anaerobic aerobic thing. It's the body's response and figuring out what's, what's the most, you know, what's the best approach for the individual. And how much work do they actually need? And it's not a minimum effective dose thing. It's actually, hey, what's the best dose to get the best response? And if that, if I've got somebody like a Mark Matisiak who can handle 20 mile runs getting ready for, for, an, for a 100 mile run, he's going to do 20 mile runs. And then the next day he's going to get back up and he's going to train and he's going to do something else. But if you can't get back up, then then you got to understand where where the rebound or where that recovery phase is missing things. So, th I mean, this is more or less. This is basically what the whole thing's about: is you learning about what is making you a better physiologically and you know mechanically at what you're doing, and are you holding up? And when it comes to training those, you're really looking for for efficiency. Yeah, we're looking for efficiency. Most people have jobs, you know, yep. and, and they, and they want to do extreme shit. Yep. So, so you have to look at that realistically. If you're going to go work an eight hour day or whatever, you got to understand that just, and this is where we've run into a lot of problems with, you know, our health is we think that going and working an eight hour, a stressful eight hour day means we should go work out for an hour or two really stressful. Mm-hmm. That's stress on stress. Right. The, the head, everything above the neck understands that, but below that neck, it doesn't all quite understand it like that. So the adaptations have to be, you have to start to understand where I map that out correctly. And just because I go out and, and run or I do CrossFit or I do whatever, or I row or whatever, and it makes me feel good right after, what's my body's response? How's my immune system? Do I, do I get colds all the time? Am I getting faster? Is my performance changing? You know, and, and that's what we're really looking at. Yeah. And those stressors, they really build up over time and that's kind of, oh, what oh yeah. People. Yep. Yep. And I mean, we, we've seen, you know, and I mean, that was one of the, you know, things that people saw with what we were doing. Oh, you're just going to, people are going to burn out so hard from this. And it's like, if you're paying attention to your energy, 
No. And it's actually less time. We've actually taken a professional athlete who's literally, I think, I think he's like over two years at this point, nonstop training. And this guy's like in his forties and he still wins triathlons. And it literally comes down to now he's doing shorter course duathlons and stuff like that and triathlons. Mm -hmm. Like he's doing under half Ironman distance. But from time to time, he goes and steps up and does the half Ironman distance and he's perfectly fine at it and finishes well. So, you know, it's it's a perfectly manageable thing if you're paying attention to recovery and you're paying attention to stuff. And I've seen just as many people, you know, prior to the CrossFit paradigm who've had adrenal fatigue, who've been buried in the sand because they're just doing way too much training. Yeah, absolutely. Now, with your athletes and the athletes that you coach, what are the lifestyle, and I know you work a lot with breath and with uh, cold tanks and stuff like that. What are the Mm -hmm. lifestyle factors that you look to control in order to reduce that stress? Sleep, breath work, cold immersion, hot immersion, diet, nutrition choices, um, you know, it, it, all, all of these things play into it. Yeah. You know, sleep is easily the biggest factor. Um, mood is the, you know, I I've been telling people for, I don't know how long mood is your number one indicator of performance, you know, of what you're going to do that day and, and trying to confuse yourself or trying to manipulate yourself into doing something because you don't feel like doing it is not a winning situation. You should wake up and you should want to train. And if that is not there, then, then there's, there's an issue. So you got to look at that. And, and that largely has to do with, you know, that, that can have a big piece to do with sleep because this is where, you know, your, this is where your steroids are is in sleep. (laughs) Right. And ironically, cold adaptation, the cold baths, breathing all have intimate relationships with your ability to recover and putting you into parasympathetic states um, and getting hormonal changes and all that stuff to happen. Yeah. And that stuff's really growing right now. I think with a a lot of Wim Hof and a lot of what you guys are doing are really like opening people's eyes to what is possible through, you know, cold immersion and through uh, controlling your breathing and being able to control that, that side of things. Yeah, it's I mean, Wim Hof's done a tremendous job with getting the information out. And, you know, we've been doing this stuff as long, if not longer than than he was with some some of the stuff, not um, the breathing stuff, his breath, his his method is amazing. I do think that there are many different things, which is also what we do with inside the uh, power speed endurance, uh, the PSE pro model, where we actually line out training, um, specifically for each sport now. And we have an actual breath program that literally deals with all of these aspects, whether you want some sort of super ventilation practice, which is something Wim Hof would fall into, or you want something for CO2 tolerance buildup, you know, for, for understanding that. And that is a big, big, big problem, even in athletes, Um, people who've been lifelong athletes who are very CO2 intolerant and that's not a good thing. And this is also, this could also have a big, big factor into health and why you get sick or your immune system isn't what it's doing, or you may have asthma or you may have cardiovascular disease. They've got, there's stuff that's connected to all of this. And I don't think it's a cure all. Um, I think it's a, a few spokes in the wheel of learning how to incorporate a lifestyle into what it is you're doing. So if you're, if people are listening to this and they're kind of the weekend warrior type, uh, yeah. like you said, have a good job, but just like to do epic shit on the weekends. Yeah. What is kind of the low hanging fruit that people can focus on as far as, uh, you know, breath is. Uh, yeah. The lowest hanging fruit out there is the breath work. It's simple. It's, Hey, five minutes in the morning and five minutes at night will change your physiology in a manner you wouldn't be able to comprehend in, in a, in three weeks, like how good you will feel. And, and, and there's simple stuff like that we have, you know, just a simple cadence routine. That's a one, one, you know, two, one pattern. Um, meaning the, an inhale is the one, a breath holds the one an exhale is the two, and then there's a breath, breath pause on an exhale at the end on a one. So if I had a five second inhale, I'd have a five second 
breath hold, and then I'd have a 10 second exhale, and then I'd have a five second breath pause on the end. Do that for five straight minutes. You'll change part of your physiology, you know, but you want to take it to a level that's just a little bit stressful at five minutes. You can still get through it. And that simple process right there will change physiology. Just going and doing like you go on a walk or even on your run. And if you go hypoxic, hold your breath for five or 10 seconds and then go back to normal breathing to where you normalize and then repeat that pattern, you will change your physiology. How? You will become more CO2 tolerant. You can actually, through the hypoxic work, if it's done enough, you'll literally, you'll, you'll create an EPO response. You, your body will literally start to develop more red blood cells. Really? Yeah. Now- is this, uh, and is, does this have anything to do or does it reflect in your work with the training mask? The training mask was it, a little bit. The training mask can have a little bit of a response with the CO2 tolerance. And that was one of the pieces that I liked about it. The biggest piece I liked about the training mask was that we saw gross change in motor control immediately. We saw people using their diaphragm when they weren't immediately. We saw people that we could put in a plank, for example, who didn't know how to set up correctly, would immediately set up correctly when that mask was on because there's a little bit of resistance on it. Now, you can probably do this with something well, – You, I know you can do this. You could do this with something like an expand lung, which is a, a another device out there. Um, there's several different types of resistance breathing devices. And then there's also the big thing is nasal breathing. Mm -hmm. If you just go to nasal breathing, that will li that will literally change a lot of your physiology to really get to a higher aerobic level. And it'll force you to actually set up correctly because you've got to draw air in to something that's not as easy as your mouth. Right. So same thing. You're going to, you're going to force your body to work more efficiently and in doing so it's going to create more red blood cells, carry more oxygen. For, correct. The red blood cells may not, you know, unless you're doing hypoxic work, but I know, you know, you can read, there's plenty of research out there on the hypoxic work and inducing EPO like response. We're talking like 21% changes 20 percent changes you know mm -hmm. i go i i live at three thousand feet i go up and snowboard probably once a week at about eight to nine thousand feet and i'm completely unaffected and i can go as hard as i want so you think that kind of work actually has an adaptation or a transferability to when it comes to actually doing work at elevation absolutely because I think that's what a lot of the controversy came through with the endurance or the uh, training mask to begin yep. with is people are like, well, it's not actually simulating. Yeah, well, the whole name of the thing, the elevation training mask, I right. think might have not been the greatest. But, you know, it's simulating what may it may feel like at those things. So so I didn't find that the training mask changed altitude for me, but I found that the training mask by using a resistance breathing device in a warm up which there's actually research on this now will change your training and, and and here you know when you're like 10 20 minutes into your run and you start to really feel good yep. and like you go forever yep that is when your respiratory system catches up with your muscular and cardiovascular system okay and, a res and, and resistance breathing warm-ups eradicate that. Force it quicker? Yep. Okay. So that can change in a, a training session right there. And we saw with motor control, so using it in a warm-up scenario for core uh, activation, stuff like that, was, was awesome. We also liked to use it and still do from time to time. Yeah, reco during recovery for intervals, but we do not use it when we work. Okay, so you have the athlete do the bout of work, and then they put that on it while they're recovering, and it forces. Yep. Okay. Forces better. It forces better breathing mechanics. Forces them to take in more air. Forces them to get rid of the air. It f forces more of a a a a. a uh, it just creates a better pattern for breathing. 
Gotcha. It, it's really interesting that you bring this up because a couple of weeks ago I was on an interview with Kayla Banfield, who yeah. uh, is dating James Newberry, CrossFit Games yep. athlete. And uh, <laughs> she was talking about a workout that he did, which I've been trying to get all my friends to do. I tried uh, 60 minute max cows on the air dine, only breathing through your nose. Yep. Fucking I work miserable. <laughs> yeah, yeah, I work with James. Oh, you do? Okay. Did you give him that workout? Yeah, I gave him that. Oh, okay. <laughs> nice. <laughs> Yeah. Yeah. He worked up to that. Okay. Yeah. Cause, uh, he could only hold his heart rate. It like he, he, he could only get his heart rate just below 140 nasal breathing. When we started, he's now up at about 168 and he says that he feels unreal doing it. So this is something you have him test and retest. Yeah. He uses this weekly. Okay. It, yeah. It, he's, on, it, he's on a program that I designed for him. Okay, and for people that are listening to this and are interested in adding this to to their programming, whatever their fitness routine looks like, do you do you suggest weekly? Uh yeah, yeah, yeah. Oh, I, I if you're gonna do the nasal breathing stuff, I would either implement it every single warm up and aerobic during an award or and you, every warm up you do, unless it's strictly weightlifting, should involve some sort of an aerobic component, meaning you're going and doing something monostructural for an aerobic piece for probably close to 10 minutes. That should be nasal only. If not, your entire warm up, nasal only breathing. That'll change your that that'll change you tremendously. You'll find your your respiration rate goes down throughout the day. You'll find you start to breathe through your nose when you sleep. These are all issues we have as a society is we're mouth breathers. Yeah. You know when a dog breathes through their mouth? When they're thirsty? When, when, uh, when they exhausted. are overheating and exhausted or they're sick and dying. Hmm. That's an interesting fact. <laughs> yeah. So since the CrossFit endurance days and uh, with what you're doing now with power speed endurance, how have your, I guess, methodologies or your approach to training changed based on what you've kind of found throughout coaching all these athletes because I, I know you coached uh well james newberry i know uh we had sarah hendershot on she said that you coached her as well yep uh so how how has your methodology changed throughout all these elite level athletes that you've had the experience of of coaching um i mean one you know, sarah didn't get i mean sarah got a little bit of this stuff because it was early on in what we were doing um but you know, there's, uh, I, I think the biggest change has been the breath work, but it's also come in the form of understanding metabolic shifts where we're, we look at somebody who is, if they're a working athlete, meaning they're a rower, a runner, uh, a crossfitter, um, somebody who's working, right. And we look at where they have metabolic shifts or where they got stress marks that happen. And in doing that, we've really tailored programs like James, for instance, where James had a really bumpy, uh, metabolic cart that we did on him. And we literally forced him. I've, I mean, we've got Annie Thor's daughter, Frederick, uh, her, her boyfriend. Um, I've got, the guy who plays third at the games on one of my programs. Um, we've got, uh, you know, a, a slew of people from the training plan, which is Yami Tinkanen's uh, program that have been following this stuff as well. And the biggest thing that we use is that metabolic cart and, and getting people cleaned up because unfortunately with the whole, you know, we're all human and I've fallen into all of this. Like I've done long, slow distance. I've gotten caught in way too much, just intensity. I've got, you know, you do, I, I do just CrossFit and then I hate running and it's no wonder. And you know, all this stuff. But when you look at uh, somebody who's been CrossFitting for a long time, for instance, and they think that it's just all about short and hard and doing Metcons all the time, you have a lot of problems. We've seen a lot of problems at the lower end range of their aerobic work, meaning it looks like an EKG chart until they hit basically their lactate threshold. So we want to clean that stuff up. And that is what that low level or low effort stuff ends up looking like. And so for a lot of these athletes, we've literally had them doing work at a below 130 heart rate, nasal breathing only 
for 60 minutes until they can progress up to something like what James is doing for, you know, max calories for 60 minutes and nasal breathing only to where he's, you know, changed that tremendously. So that progress really stepped away from what we were doing with, you know, a lot, the whole model with PSE where you have endurance athletes that largely do way too much aerobic training. It's just all long, slow, right. which is perfectly fine if that's the approach you want to go. But just know that when you want to go turn it up, you're not going to have that gear. Yeah, I'm reaching the ceiling with it right now. Yeah, yeah. And, and it's going to come at a cost. So, you know, it's entirely up to you what you want to do, but might have a few suggestions. And one of those is learning how to deal with that intensity. And so th there's still a metabolic cart we'll look at. And so we have that within the, the PS, we, we launch on May um, PSE Pro and the, we have different levels of it. And one of those levels, a couple of those levels have the metabolic test in it so that you actually get the interval work and, and even the tempo work or the, or the uh, uh, stamina work with specific parameters based off of your stress responses. Because if you're ru just running out and doing something at a specific level um, based on just thinking it versus, hey, you know, 10 beats lower – you had a stress marker that went off that we could clean up and would make you feel a whole lot better. And you'd be a lot more faster at that lower heart rate than you are at that higher one right now. So it's just teaching people how to really get efficient at those metabolic processes and those stress markers so they can clean it up. Yeah. The breath work largely helps with a lot of this stuff as well. You know, it inevitably helps create more, more mitochondria. You're stimulating the aerobic system more. Uh, I mean, if I'm f having you breathe heavy for five or 10 minutes, there's no difference. in you know, I mean, is it any irony that if you go out and run after five or 10 minutes, you're huffing and puffing too, you know, and you feel better. Well, there's, there's a lot of connections to that. There's a lot of similarities in that stuff. And so if we stimulate it correctly and if we actually challenge CO2 tolerance a little bit, we can start to develop you physiologically in ways that you didn't know you could develop. Yeah. So you're looking at it from a basic or a, a straight up energy cell production standpoint as well with the breathing. Yep. yep. Which would have an adaptation no matter you know what the hell you were doing. So will the ice. So will the heat. What is the ice protocol that you're that you're using with people? We usually have people go three minute bouts, a little bit, they anything under three minutes, uh, working up to three minutes, getting them in the ice. We don't do it after training, post training, because we want the inflammatory response to happen. We don't want to shut that down, but we use it as a protocol, probably forty five minutes to sixty minutes after they train, or just they use it in the morning or the evening. The ice will help reset the system, the nervous system. It'll help. It, it, there's, there, there's research. Dr. Rhonda Patrick has, has exposed this stuff on mitochondrial biogenesis through cold training. Mm -hmm. um, the same stuff that, you know, you go get in a sauna and when it starts to get claustrophobic, that's the same exact response that you're going to get during a, in, endurance training. When your heat shock proteins start to fucking come apart, that is <laughs> direct relationship. There's hormonal stuff that's happening. It's all connected. I could have you do three rounds of heat and ice, maxing out the heat and doing three minute ice rounds. And you would be exhausted at the end of that yeah. because you're revving your metabolism up and down, up and down and having it work in different ways. Fight the cold, fight the heat. It's interesting. And I think you're at the forefront of it, but it's interesting how the conversation has really progressed to looking at the, the body as this this system where it, it used to be, I think, very segmented on how you trained, how you recovered. Yeah. I mean, we, we have a concept and in, in that everything is everything, man. And it's not an old, it's not a new saying, but it's, you know, everything is connected. And if you're not looking at like, if you're not looking at how you can connect everything together, then, you know, it's, I, I don't, I, I, I don't understand that, but <laughs> right, right. I, I like seeing how we can connect it all together. And, and I think that's why human performance is, is, is becoming so bitching right now is we're finally starting to look at things as a, as a, as a whole and how we can implement all different, you know, a bunch of different stuff. Do you see the ceiling opening up as far as human performance is concerned uh, in the oh, next it's, decade? It, it's, it's opening already right now in ways that, 
you know, we can't believe, I mean, you know, I, we're, we're getting involved with Stanford medicine on some research right now that is going to be game changing. That's cool. I yeah. Think, uh, the level is just getting out of yeah, control. Yeah. <laughs> People are interested. I mean, the the you know the military, uh, the DoD, um, you know the medical world, you know human performance. It's all you know. I I believe it all. If if elite athletes are doing it, everybody should be doing it. It it it's that doesn't mean you need to be doing the dosing of it, but it's like it, if it pertains to a kid, it pertains to an ath an, an elite athlete, or it, it pertains to grandma. It, 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 we all can get something from it all. Yeah, completely agree. So uh, for people that are listening and are interested in the PSE stuff, um, kind of who would that be for, uh, for the coaching part? And then how, how would they get involved? Well, ultimately it's for anybody. So you could literally pick a program based on, like if you just want to get the running stuff, if you want to do more running or you want, you know, just the metabolic stuff, you can get the metabolic, you could get the PSE run, or you could get the bike, you could get PSE bike and do all your metabolic training on the bike or, you know, swimming. Um, you know, we have all of these different programs or we have the full package. You could get them all and choose what it is you want to do that day. You know, take a CrossFit athlete, for instance, like, they could get it and they would get basically almost like a triathlon looking program, right? And if they've got a pre-existing program, they could discard the strength and conditioning work and the CrossFit stuff and use the, you know, the swim, the bike, the run, the rock, the, um, you know, or, or they could sign up for the breathing program and get the entire breathing package, which is, you know, all the breath work, you get five different protocols throughout the day that you can pick and choose from and see how they're implemented in between workouts or before workouts or after workouts. Um, or we've got the fuel package, which is the nutrition stuff that kind of shows you how to bounce off, you know, based off of the training that's happening and what's going on, where that fits in and what you should be focused on based on who you are. So it, it, it's a full kind of deal that you get to customize yourself. Okay. Nice. Very cool. Yeah. Uh, so the Lionheart kicker is the final question, and uh, it is if you could give advice, blanket advice, and it was guaranteed that everybody in the world would hear it, uh, it'd be translated to every language. They may not all follow it, but they would definitely hear it. Uh, what would you tell people? Challenge your own beliefs constantly. And, and do you think that's how you've gotten to where you've gotten as far as experimenting with all of these different? Oh, different I things? know, I know, and I, I know it's why I married my wife. I know it's why I, you know. You know, she makes sure that, I'm, you know, challenged for sure. And I love that, um, you know, but I, you know, it's the people in my life. They're the exact same way. You know, there's, there's no irony. You know, people ask me, they're like, do you drink? And I'm like, yeah, no, not, no, I don't. And they're like, why not? I'm like, I just don't, haven't found a real need to it. And ironically, it's pretty much every single person in my life doesn't drink either. They may have a glass of wine or, you know, from time to time, but nobody drinks. And I'm not, and I'm just using this as an example. Yeah. Right. But all of these people are living a lifestyle specifically based on their experience and what maybe partying or drinking, you know, may have a, uh, an issue with. And I'm not saying don't drink. I'm just saying, Hey, what, you know, what, what is it you believe about your, you know, your doing is awesome. And I would say that if you get stuck in doing one thing and you, and, and challenge that and see, see what else you can do and see what else you can change. And, you know, I think change is the biggest catalyst for everybody. It's a, it's a guaranteed to happen throughout your entire existence, at least here. And the one common denominator of people that I see, whether they're old or young, uh, is the inability to change and change their beliefs. And they get stuck, and that is where they live. So tearing out your mainframe like that is pretty difficult. So yep. getting rid of these preconceived notions that you're born with, uh, it's an insane, even if you know... Uh, to like topically, it's what you should be doing. Actually doing it is pretty difficult. Uh, yep. How do you keep yourself? How do you keep yourself uh, toe in the line? Start small. I start very small <laughs> and I get consistent at it. 
I've gotten to a point where I make we we literally make life altering changes probably every three months. That's awesome. Yeah, and radically it, different than what it's people. It's very want. scary too, man. It's yeah. very scary, and and, and it, it doesn't ever change. The fear is mm-hmm. always there, but the outcome is unbelievable. Fuck yeah, that's awesome. Brad McKenzie, thanks for being on, man. I really appreciate it. You got it, Rick. Thanks. All right. Thanks, guys. Yep. Thanks for listening to Lionheart Radio. I hope that the information from today's show will make you fitter, happier, and healthier. For the show notes of this episode and every episode, head to www.lionheartrad.io. Yep, just like Lionheart Radio. And please, if you have the time, head over to iTunes and give us a five-star rating. It really helps us to know that we're on the right track in delivering you reliable information and value. As always, feedback is welcome. If you have any comments on the show or would like to suggest a guest, send me an email at rick at louisvive.com. That's L-U-A-V-I-V-E dot com. Thanks for your support, and we will see you next time. Bitch, I feel good. Don't I look stupendous? My shine is so endless, and shit you can do to end this. Even when I'm dead, niggas still gon' bump that chip shit. Coke, white, escalate on cinches for you dipshit. So you won't forget this. Midwest, nigga, be the coldest.